Coming up on Tech News Weekly, Aunt Pruitt is here to join me for an episode. We start out by talking about how to properly clean your smartphone, plus Photoshopping a dog. That's right, Adobe's Photoshop is encouraging some fun and fancy free. Before we talk about Robin Hood's downtime with Alex Wilhelm of TechCrunch, yeah, some people lost out on some money. And we have a great chat with Joss Fong of Vox's Recode about computer-generated content. Is this computer-generated? I don't know. Stay tuned to find out. Tech News Weekly is brought to you from LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? LastPass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is Twit. Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 123, recorded Thursday, March 5th, 2020. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Hover. Use a domain name that truly represents you and your passion. Visit hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. Hello and welcome back to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. I'm Micah Sargent. I am Ant Pruitt. That's right, you are. Uh, (laughs) Jason is out today. He will be back in the saddle soon, but so excited to have Ant here with us uh, for another episode of Tech News Weekly. Yes, yes, yes. Glad to be here. Glad you're here. So we're going to kick things off with our stories of the week this time, Uh, and I'll kick things off with mine. I think it's a very sort of timely, as you mentioned earlier, story. Mm -hmm. Uh, Wired has put together a fantastic guide on how to clean your smartphone, your keyboard, and your mouse the right way. Um, The fact is that our devices are just loving those germs they you know germs lock onto them they they stay there in fact it says in the article viruses can cling to glass surfaces for up to 96 hours mm. um which i don't know about you but i kind of think that's a pretty long time pretty pretty scary pretty substantial time there um so you know there there's a right way and a wrong way to clean the different devices that you have mm-hmm. and uh the document kind of or the, the article sort of goes through the different ways that you want to do that to keep your device safe because if you're using really harsh chemicals uh one of the things about phones um modern phones and one of the things that i'm always telling some friends and family members who like to put uh, screen protectors on their devices that's fine. If you want a screen protector, that's fine. I'm not. I'm not judging. I have to say, wait a minute. Something wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with screen protectors, but the device itself has this excellent oleophobic coating that they put on the screen that keeps your fingerprints from sticking to the screen for a longer period of time okay. for causing you know germs and build up to sort of get on the device. And so that's why it's so easy to just take your phone and sort of like wipe it across your pant leg and those fingerprints go away okay. because of the oleophobic coating. Okay. So because of that, you don't want to use harsh chemicals, uh, Clorox wipes and things like that on your device. It can start to wear away at that coating. Uh, which is, of course, that. yeah, that's that's sort of an important thing to keep in mind. You know, you see a lot of people putting hand sanitizer all over their screen and rubbing it away. Over time, that can start to wear away at that oleophobic coating, which then starts to uh, affect the screen's ability to sort of repel those fingerprints and things. Um, so you need to keep that in mind. There are some for the device suggestions that they have in here. There were a few things that for me kind of. Uh, it didn't seem like enough, I guess, um, because they talk about with a with a phone, you want to use a microfiber cleaning cloth, apply mm-hmm. some pressure and wipe away um, and then start without any fluids at all. And then if you need to, a little bit of soap with some water on a damp cloth to sort of clean. That's that's not bad. That part there, because um, it's not as abrasive as something like a pure rail or anything, right, right? exactly it's not as strong yeah so you're not you're you know you're basically breaking down the outer coating the uh lipid bilayer of mm-hmm. the 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 germ um to to 
break it apart. But uh, there are some different products out there that I have used in the past. Whoosh is mm-hmm. one that um, I have used for years and I think is a fine product for cleaning your screens and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that one does a little bit more. It also is good for polishing the screen. In fact, yes, we'll bring it on right now so I can talk about it. Uh, screen Whoosh. Shine. It is a screen and device cleaner. And I first saw this at um, CES many years ago where they t- they had a... Um, they took someone's hand after right. it had touched a phone and they put it down on an auger plate and then they let that grow and the bacteria the bacteria different germs had grown in the shape of that uh, that Ugh. handprint Ugh. and so this is you know specially formulated to to clean the screen and uh, sort of get those things off while still being alcohol and ammonia free we also have this it looks like it came from uh, ShamWow infomercial. Yes, it does. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, screen guard. Wow. But this stuff is fantastic. It's a foaming spray. And so you spray it on. Oh, I don't, I'm not going to do that right now. Um, you spray it on and it foams up foams and it really up. cleans the screen. And in fact, the little tip there is that uh, Leo and I use this every Tuesday before we record the show. Um, so it's pretty good stuff too. So you sprayed it, sprayed that directly on the screen? I'm, yes. I'm a little leery about that well, because so you don't, TVs have ruined me from spraying things directly onto them because you could blow up your television. And you want to be careful about what, uh, what devices you're spraying it on because mm. uh, a lot of them will actually say, take the cleaning cloth, spray it on the yeah. cleaning cloth, and then wipe your screen. Um, I think we're just a little laissez-faire with ours at this point because these are water resistant devices um and so okay. it doesn't end up being an issue yeah. uh, for that so that's another thing that they kind of mentioned in the article is you know be aware of whether you, what ip rating you have on your devices and then use that to sort of uh better understand mm. now another product that i use uh it's called phone soap yes um i know them yeah i have one of those you do you mm-hmm. okay you want to tell them about it well it is a a about a six inch device it's a plastic box essentially uh you put your mobile phone in it they even have some tablet size ones now I mm-hmm. believe. but you put your mobile phone inside of it and close the lid and a uv light fires off and it just bakes out the bacteria and cleans your phone within a few minutes without having to use chemicals or abrasives or anything like that and I was a little leery about them when I first saw them a couple of years ago, but then I want to say Padre did an episode of Hands on Tech or something here on the network that he demoed it and actually pulled cultures. Oh, nice. As part of the test. Know how. And and the cultures showed, hey, well, it, it's working. It's doing what it's supposed to do. So I've been on board ever since. And it's a really, really neat device. And I keep ours at the house in like somewhere in the kitchen or a common area. And I so tell everybody, just it. just sanitize your de- devices, you know, every day, you know, and it yeah. just takes a second. You stick it in there, walk away, come back and you're good to and go. It's ready to go. And it looks like, and this was the thing I was, uh, someone had asked me, what is that thing that you mentioned? And so I uh, went to Amazon to find it mm-hmm. and they're sold out of them completely yeah. uh, on Amazon. I wonder why. Hmm. I wonder what's got people doing that. <laughs> uh, so that, but that is the, the phone soap UV light sanitizer. So essentially with that device, UV light can break down uh, the bits of a virus and uh, cause it to, you know, cause, I think it, what is it? Causes the RNA to separate if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, it breaks it down into pieces so it can't replicate. So it's another great way to keep your devices clean. Uh, the article also goes into detail about your keyboard and mouse, which those ones uh, really get dirty and messy and carry lots of germs. So you do need to uh, to be mindful of that, particularly yeah. if you have a shared uh, space. I think um, I haven't had to share an actual desk Mm -hmm. in a long time, but I can remember at a newsroom I used to work at, we shared desks and I can't even imagine right now. (laughs) Yeah. So just uh, be mindful of all of that. Keep your stuff clean and uh, check out that article from Wired, which of course we'll include in the show notes. You know, it's pretty scary to think about the fact that 
our keyboards and phones are so filthy, but yet our toilet seats and whatnot are a lot cleaner. Yeah, because those are things we remember to clean and you know, think you about cleaning. Think about that perspective. And we, yeah, you know, you're not touching them with the uh, vehicles of contamination that are yeah. your hands. I don't know about you, but I'm wearing pants right now, so <laughs> that vehicle of contamination is covered. But these ones are all over everywhere, <laughs> touching everything. Uh, let's move on to your story of the week. I think this one's fun. Oh, man. So... I know Mr. Laporte has his own thoughts about Twitter and the Twitterverse. Me personally, I enjoy spending time on Twitter and chatting with our, our TNW fans, Twit fans, and hands-on photography fans quite regularly. And I follow a lot of different content creators as well as following the folks at Adobe and Photoshop and Lightroom. Well, this week, Photoshop put up a tweet <laughs> from uh, another artist, uh, Miss Victoria Pavlov, and says, uh, hey, here's just a cute dog. We all know you guys know how to use Photoshop. So um, we're just going to leave a picture of this cute dog right here. And walked away. Now, with this being Twitter mm-hmm. and the internet, you got to assume there's going to be some crazy stuff that's going to happen on there. And, of course, people did join in, <laughs> grabbed the image, and started doing some interesting and fascinating things with Photoshop to show off their little Photoshop skills. Um, <laughs> I, I got to say, it was pretty funny to see the one in there where, no, they didn't necessarily use Photoshop. They use Microsoft Paint. I love that one. I can't even get it out. It's so funny. <laughs> but that's, that's just classic internet, classic Twitter. Um, I thought it was fun. Good job from Photoshop just to, you know, spark some conversation and a little bit of creativity. But yeah, if you're watching the video stream here, you're going to see some pretty interesting different uh, images. Yes. <laughs> and edits, if you will. I love that they took they took the shape of the dog out in this one and put the dog's fur everywhere but where the dog is. <laughs> and then clone stamped the background. Chicken head. Hey, chicken head 21. What's up, pal? Chicken head 21. There's, For your, people there's wondering. your image right there. Uh, Chickenhead 21 is one of our regular uh, chat folks. And so, um, yeah, there's where the, where's the dog? The yeah, but I, dog. And see, then you get points like that one where they had a cat in there. I, I don't quite get it, but sure. Cat dog, cat dog. I, had, I, I wanted to give it a bit of an effort with Photoshop. Uh-huh. I'm not the best at doing composites because my brain doesn't necessarily work that way. Okay. I, I just struggle with that and i'm trying to work on my imagination a little bit maybe i need to maybe i need to tap into mr sergeant's imagination <laughs> or whatever oh see i've already got so many ideas see that I'm quickly on tackling you know, after I, this. i've known about this all week and i still didn't have anything <laughs> until a little while ago but i do I, like what you came up with. i put a little little image together and tweeted it back to him and i think we have access to it in our doc <laughs> and it's probably the worst photoshop effort you'll ever see but that is my our friend uh, Matteo Doni and I went out on a photo shoot and I just took the dog and did it this way. I think you should have surrounded the dog with goats. Isn't that his thing? Isn't oh like yes. Goats? See, yeah. see, you you have the imagination. <laughs> but no, I do I do enjoy. I think you did a yeah. This is fun. This oh is fun. man, dang. I need to add goats. Don't show that to Mateo chat room, please. Yeah, <laughs> wait for the goats. Um, but yeah, you can head to Twitter and check that out um, and share your own too. And if you want to tag us in yeah. it, I would love to see what uh, you folks come up with because I think it's it's fun. And it's fun. You, and if you want to see some much better Photoshop work, just go to the Photoshop Instagram page. They're, they share a lot of different artists there that have a Ooh. ton of talent, way more Photoshop talent than I. So go look over there too. I'm going to have to check that out too. Uh, Well, up next, Robin Hood suffered some downtime earlier this week. That is the investment service that's sort of an uh, app-based system. So how bad is it? Well, we are going to answer that question next. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Hover. Hover is a jumping off point for many entrepreneurs, and they want you to start your business with a domain name that truly showcases who you are. Hover has over 300 domain name extensions to choose from when building your brand online. No matter what you want to build, there's a domain name waiting for it. Now, I love Hover. I've used Hover for quite a bit of time for joke domains, for serious domains, for everything in between. They make it way too simple. Slofy, you mean? (laughs) You mean Slofy? I mean (laughs) Slofy. 
<laughs> Slofi.net and Slofi.org. I'm not going to let you forget that. S-L-O-P-H-I-E. I spelled it wrong. It's it's night. It's my national nightmare. That but that's okay. I, Hover got you locked look, down. Look, Hover locked me down so quick, <laughs> and uh, because of their great prices, I keep those around. I keep them still. I still uh, have them uh, ready to go, and uh, they currently link to that whole embarrassment of mine. Um, <laughs> but th th another story that I'll tell really quick is that my sister, um, she designs these custom shoes, and you got to see some mm -hmm. my mom was wearing. Yep. Uh, and so sort of as a way to support her, I wanted to, you know, say, hey, you're doing great work, and here's, uh, here's a way that I can sort of help you. Um, I made her a domain, um, leelaces.com, leilaces.com, and I went on to Hover in moments as we were having our little text chat and signed up that domain and then created an email for her that her customers could email her at. Mm -hmm. uh, and that took no time at all. It was so easy to do, and I was excited to be able to tell her, hey, here's this. You're official now. Uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it does. It feels nice to get a domain and mm -hmm. to, to be able to call that your own, whether you have a, a system set up or not. So you're going to find excellent technical support if you do have any questions they are available to answer them, uh, any, any that you may have. Their support team doesn't upsell you which is really nice because a lot of times that's one of the situations that you run into is, is the support team going, oh, um, well, maybe you want to add this kind of support. You want to add this sort of uh, privacy features and things like that. That's not fun. You don't want that. Uh, well, Hover doesn't do that to you. They've got free who is privacy protection which is very important. Mm -hmm. They've got a clean and easy to navigate user experience and user interface, monthly sales on popular top level domains. So you can go there at any time and uh, get a quick and easy deal, which is really nice. It's not hard to see why Hover is a popular choice for people who are starting all kinds of businesses. Keeping your domain name separate from hosting also gives you the flexibility to choose the right platform for your business. So if you decide to switch from one to the other, it's very simple to do. Use a domain name that truly represents you and your passion. Visit hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. That's hover.com slash twit for 10% off your domain extension for a full year. And we thank Hover for their support. All righty, let's talk about Robinhood. Uh, this is the stock trading app and service. Uh, it's, it's a free alternative to some of the more pricey ones that are out there. Mm -hmm. And I can remember when Robinhood first came around, it was something that I was really excited about. Um, I haven't paid a whole lot of attention to it uh, right. in, in, you know, in a while, but... Didn't they have, I remember their hook was to like give you a couple of shares of something for free. Yeah, Just yeah. They want to get you going and get you excited about it, get mm -hmm. you into it. And um, so, I mean, they've gained popularity enough that when they experienced some downtime earlier this week, people were pretty upset about it. <laughs> uh, Alex Willem is here from TechCrunch to talk to us about what happened, what it means, and everything you need to know about Robin Hood. Ah, oh, there you Hi. are. Hi. Yes. Hi. I didn't see you there. <laughs> no worries. I am I'm, I'm here, I promise. Oh, excellent, excellent. So let's uh let's get right into it. The my first question is um sort of did I do a good job of explaining what Robinhood is in its current form? You know, have there been any uh new features since the early days? And then what happened earlier this week that kind of has everybody uh, a little upset? Yeah, I would add a little bit to it. I thought your summary was was a great place to start. They have added things like crypto trading. So if you wanted to buy Bitcoin or anything like that, you can now do that also through the Robinhood platform. Um, they had a bit of, of a fiasco uh, trying to add a high yield uh, savings account and they kind of bent the rules and gone to a bit of trouble there. Oops. And uh, I would throw in a note about growth because it's uh, it's not just another app out there that has some users that we probably care about a little bit. This has become one of the biggest uh, brokerage and trading platforms in the world. I think it has like 10 million users. Um, and so it, it's it's enormous now. And I think that that hook of free trading um, was an enormous uh, kind of lever point for it to use to grow uh, so much so that a lot of its competitors had to follow suit. So when we talk about this company, it's not just, you know, one more startup in the mix. It's a big one. And that's why, as you said, when it had some downtime, uh, it was a big deal. And on that front, it didn't just have downtime once. It had downtime twice mm -hmm. uh, on consecutive days, uh, on Monday for a very, very long period of time, and then for a couple of hours on Tuesday. 
And if you're not an investor or you don't have a 401k or whatever, you might not know what happened, but we've been experiencing some market volatility. Oh, and the markets went up dramatically and down dramatically this week. And so if all of a sudden you can't trade and that was your reason for being on Robinhood because trades are free, it's a pretty big deal. So they took a lot of heat for this. That's why it was in the news. That's why we're talking about it. So big scale, lots of features, whoops, downtime, super embarrassing. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I think about uh, with with trading is, you know, you used to have those images of, of Wall Street where the people were shouting and da 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 da. And that does not <laughs> yeah. work that way anymore. Instead, you've got computers that are moving extremely quickly to get these sales out and, and uh, making exchanges and trades. And so I imagine it's kind of a big deal if your service for doing uh, your, your stock trading is down for that long period of time. I mean, people, are they, are they asking for refunds or how, how, what is the, the outcry here? And, uh, do we have any, I kind of, it's fun whenever someone sort of uh, tries to do some calculations on, oh, and this is the potential money that people lost and some ridiculous <laughs> yeah. number. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the potentially lost sum is, is, is indeterminate because you can't really tell what people would have done uh, on the day when they couldn't trade. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that if you go through forums like Wall Street Bets, which is a, a, a rude place on the Internet, I'm not recommending it, but they <laughs> are big Robin Hood users uh, or the, the investing subreddit or other forums online where people kind of congregate to talk about trades. People were posting things like I couldn't sell. I lost twenty five thousand dollars today because of Robin Hood. Now. I can't independently verify those, but there were so many of those claims and they were all kind of the same variety, posting screenshots of their account, talking about what they couldn't do. Um, if Robinhood tried to make all of that right, I don't know if they could afford it, frankly. Oh, what wow. they've done instead is uh, after apologizing and uh, trying to give an explanation about what happened, uh, they offered people a couple of free months of use of their, I think, Robinhood Gold service which is worth about five bucks a month. So what they offered was kind of like $15 of in-house currency for services. And I don't know if that relatively pathetic Band-Aid is going to be able to assuage the user base and uh, not convince people that if they're going to trade options or make regular day trades, they should go somewhere else that also now has you know zero cost trades. Now, I'm not totally familiar with the, the startup side of, of Robinhood, but you said they have almost 10 million subscribers. Is that what you just said? I believe they have 10 million accounts. Uh, now, there is a differentiation point between the two the services that are out there because uh, E-Trade, I think, has fewer accounts, okay. but E-Trade accounts tend to have more money in them. Okay. So what you have on Robinhood are a lot of kind of like, I think, younger millennials, maybe late Gen Z, a lot of folks that don't have lots of money and they don't have traditional brokerage accounts. And so they put some money into Robinhood as a starting point. Okay. And that's cool. That's a fine place to start. So the account number is a bit more impressive than I think. It sounds a bit more impressive than it actually is, if that makes sense then. So when I hear about an outage, I'm assuming it was like a scale problem, uh, just just too much data. Uh, coming into their infrastructure and just couldn't handle it. Was that the case here? Is this something that they could build up with scale and, and keep this from happening down the road? Or heck, do they even have the resources to further invest in a uh, bigger backbone, if you will? Yeah, no, it, it's a great question. Uh, so I'll answer in reverse. So they've raised oceans of money. They've raised, I think, $912 million to date. So certainly... Uh, oh, as one of the best cash. funded startups. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that, I, I would laugh too. It's a lot of, it's an insane amount of money. Uh, they should be able to afford to buy all the engineering talent and capacity they need. But even if you have all the resources, if you don't put them together correctly, it doesn't always work. So what they said was, and I, I pulled this up for us because I'll probably get to it. Um, multiple factors, according to the company, contributed to the unprecedented load that ultimately led to the outages. The factors included high volatility, historic market conditions, record volume, and record signups. Okay. So one, kind of a lackluster explanation because mm -hmm. surely a trading platform is designed to handle high volatility. Markets go up and down. Yeah, that's right. how this uh, works. <laughs> but, right? Because you'd want to trade more when things are happening. Uh, but people did complain about the record signups point. It felt like the company was trying to spin this as a win, uh, but it wasn't a win. It was a fail. So there were some kind of PR issues there. Huh. Yeah, I mean... Are there are there any other platforms that are similar to this at all? Um, I remember there being, and I can't remember the name of it now, but it would round up the money that you spent to the next whole Acorns. dollar. Acorns, yeah. Is that one still around? Is, there, it is. is it an alternative to this? Are there others out there that are anywhere near the funding goals that, uh, or funding, not goals, but achievements that Robinhood has gotten? 
Yeah, so one thing we've seen in kind of the the fintech fin services world in the last, I want to say, eighteen months, is a lot of companies that started off doing one thing have increased their kind of service. So, like for example, SoFi uh, began doing kind of student loan refinancing. Now they have a savings account function. They'll let you buy stocks on the applications. You can do that too. Acorns started off as a way to round up your expenses and save your first kind of like couple thousand dollars. I think they also now do stocks. They also have a checking account and a debit card, um, just as everyone's trying to do more things. So the question about you know who competes with Robinhood? Well, a lot of folks. Um, you can you can buy stocks relatively inexpensively through a host of applications now. Uh, Robinhood's probably the purest play. It has the biggest brand. I mean, I, I've seen Robinhood commercials on TV. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they're you know they're really trying bank. to get out there and. and Go for it. Sorry. Other than going through your bank, say your bank offers a, a brokerage account. I mean, you could do that. It just depends on what you want. Mm-hmm. And I think that a lot of folks want an app in their pocket that's designed to be mobile and they want cheap or zero cost trades. And so Robinhood really did hit part of the market that was pretty exciting. Um, personally, I, I use the, uh, the major brokerages for my retirement accounts because I'm old and boring. Um, but I think <laughs> the kids want something old, that's kind of cool really. and neat. <laughs> he said he's old. Come on. Um, <laughs> well, compared to compared to these millennials, you know, I don't know. Yeah, these true. millennials. Oh <laughs> man. No, I, I, I guess so. It, it's you know with coronavirus and with um, with the the campaign and all I'm mean, all the stuff that's going on right now. Um, does has Robinhood sort of? I know that uh, they said this is what happened. What are they doing now to? to fix the problem and and what are they doing sort of going forward as we continue to experience a high volatility in the market? (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I don't think they've announced yet uh, specific remedies to their process, platform, and services. I presume what they're doing is working their backsides off, trying to make their tech work together better. Mm-hmm. But what we can do is go back in time to when they had uh, the uh, high yield savings account offering that they had to pull because they kind of missed the mark on some regulatory issues. Uh, what they did after that was hire a bunch of people to help fix those problems. Mm-hmm. So even though the company has a history of being a bit loose with the rules and maybe moving a bit too fast on engineering, they also have a history of hiring people intelligently to fix things. So my hope is they're taking some of their money, maybe some of their TV money, and hiring people to fix the load issues because you certainly can't go down ever again because you know there's no way to come back from the trust loss if right. after this embarrassing failure of the two days in a row, you do it again. So I, I, if they're not doing that, I'll be shocked. I guess. Yeah. Uh, The last question I would have for you is, um, are there regulations or laws in place that, um, you know, act as as sort of protection when these things happen? And in the way that, I mean, this isn't a mishandling of data in the same way that, uh, you know, uh, one of the like Equifax or something like that. But um, with these new startups, that's one of the things that I'm always curious about, like you said, they kind of play fast and loose with the rules. Um, are there any protections in place for people's uh, finances going uh, with these these newer services? There, there are rules and regulations, but what I'm not sure about is what they say about downtime. Mm-hmm. Because when you think about a lot of the regulatory structure that deals with the stock market and money, uh, not all of it's very new. Some of it uh, is from an outdated period in which uh, a mobile phone, mobile app based trading system wasn't really in mind. And so I don't know how the current legal structure would apply to Robinhood's downtime. But what they can be is sued. And I think <laughs> there's going to be some lawsuits. We're going to find out the answer to your question. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's a bit soon to say. But given the number of people that were impacted, their level of activity and the potential losses they've kind of endured, uh, we're going to see some some legal action. And I, I'm I'm never rooting against a company. Robin has done a lot of really cool things. But in this case, um, they, they kind of earned it. Yeah, you know, this seems yeah. like they uh, they kind of deserve to get hit. So I'm sure we'll talk about this again down the road, but it's going to be a fascinating legal uh, next couple of quarters for the company. Yeah. Well, Alex Wollum of TechCrunch, thank you so much for joining us. If people want to follow you online and check out your work, where do they go to do that? Uh, as always, uh, techcrunch.com, or if you're on the tweets, I'm Alex on Twitter, and uh, I'm occasionally on uh, on shows like Twit and, uh, of course, Tech News uh, Weekly, so awesome. I'm around here sometimes as well. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank Thanks, you, y'all. Have a good one. See Bye. you, man. All right. So next up, computer-generated content continues to gain different definitions of today. We have amazing graphics a la CGI shown in most of the blockbuster films that we enjoy. And we also have AI tools built into some of our creative apps, such as 
Photoshop and After Effects. This is a good thing, right? Yeah, I think right? so. Right? Okay. So, so what about suggested texts in our emails and in the DMs that we send throughout today? Uh, joining us today is Joss Fogg, and she has a fascinating piece from Rico discussing this matter. Hello, Miss Joss. How you doing? Hey, guys. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Appreciate you joining us. Um, your piece up on uh, on Recode was pretty fascinating, and it, it struck a chord with me a little bit because I didn't think about the predict predictive text that we have in email mm -hmm. and in text messaging, and put that towards you know what would an author do or a computer generated author do uh, as far as creating a, a story, an article, or anything like that. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Can you can you share a little bit more about your your story from Recode? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a video that uh, we published, Vox, uh, Recode with Vox, and um, it's interesting because there's, there hasn't been really a reason to think about it in that context because this is the ability to sort of predict full sentences, full paragraphs, even full stories is very new. So the kind of technology that we have in our cell phones, which is predictive texting that everyone has had some experience with, I personally like don't find it all that useful. But uh, there are a lot of memes where people will sort of be like, start your text with this and see how it finishes it. And does it say something about you? Yeah. And um, the, the, the technology behind that is a language model. And it's basically just a computer program that has sort of a sense of the statistical use of various words. Um, and the ones that we have in our cell phones have to be pretty small because, you know, they have to fit on our phones. Right. But the ones that researchers are using now are gigantic. And that has meant that they can produce text that is incredibly plausible over several paragraphs. So this one that we're looking at from my story um, is a, basically a, a fake news article that was written entirely by a machine. And it was uh, programmed, uh, the algorithm was programmed by a, um, an author named Adam Gaichi, who does sort of blog posts about machine learning. And it he's got a whole website called News You Can't Use that is just news generated by uh, a computer. Wow. That's, Let's see. Hmm. The, it's fascinating looking at the world of AI and I've always had my sort of a, a, a gripe with it because AI could be super duper useful, but there are going to be times where it's not properly trained and can lead to issues with um, information being just flat out false or just, just sort of missing the mark, if you will. Now, if you look at the, the texting world, like, um, like you said, there's the meme of start a text message and, and see what the predictive text comes up with right after that. What about using that for, say, like a fantasy book or, or, or something, you know, sort of off the wall, like a comedy or what have you. Do you think there are authors out there thinking along those lines to say, you know, let's try this and see if we can make a funny story out of it? There definitely are. And that's what I think are some of the more interesting uses of these, um, this particular type of technology is the creative ones. So there is a game called AI Dungeon. Um, it's basically a text game where you can you can interact with this algorithm in a way that the two of you are together building a fantasy story. Um, so you'll give it a little prompt and then it will kind of build off of that and then you can say a little bit more and you kind of go back and forth. And the sort of coherence and fluency of the output from those is just so far beyond what was possible even a year ago and certainly three years ago when we used to see some experiments with AI generated text. I remember there being a screenplay written by, you know, AI mm -hmm. and they had uh, they had some, you know, kind of big name actors sort of perform it. And it just was nonsensical. And that's why it was funny is that the, the grammar wasn't there. The logic certainly wasn't there. No consistent ideas, no consistent characters. Um, the ability to do that is just started uh, as of 2019. <laughs> that's fascinating. Now, if we were to look at this uh, from, I don't want to put this, with it being a little bit messed up and wonky at times, what what is in place to try to make this better? And is this something that we could potentially lean on in the future as it gets better? Have you seen any, any, any research or discussion about that? Yeah. And I don't want to overstate how good it is. It can't write, um, the way humans write. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't do research. Like it can't come up with, you know, 
uh, accurate stories. It can just sort of mimic our language use because it understands the statistics of which words we sort of put together frequently. So you're saying and all so, of these bloggers are safe, right? <laughs> I really think that people that produce original content that includes sort of research, reporting, um, I think that it's going to be a long time before any computer can do that. Mm -hmm. What they can do now is create kind of nonsense. And I mean, it, in, a, in a nicer way to put it, art. Um, and as researchers sort of work to mold these, they can probably be able to summarize documents with this kind of technology um, more better than they ever have before. So you give it sort of an existing set of text, and it will give you sort of an original condensed version of that information. Um, that might be possible quite soon. Question answering, where you give it a document and then ask it a question based on the content in that document, um, which is probably going to be useful for a lot of businesses, for customer support and chatbot applications. Um, so I don't think uh, I don't think, you know, real writers and uh, journalists are at, you know, are, are going to have their jobs threatened by this kind of thing. If anything, the uh, the proliferation of fake text might make people sort of seek established um, publishers uh, as sort of a refuge from the chaos that uh, could be unleashed with these kinds of technologies. I don't know why, but with it being the election year, it, it seems like I could see someone trying to leverage this as part of their mudslinging across the party lines or something like that. Just nonsensical gibberish published out there mm -hmm. that yet will continue to get a ton of clicks and reads and shares and things like that. As Given our, our, um, <laughs> our oh, predisposition to just read headlines, I think that that right. is, is not a surprise. If you see that there's a whole article there and you know you read the headline, you see that there's a whole article there, you kind of just go, okay, well, there's some, they, I'm sure the facts are in there. And then you just <laughs> go off of the headline. <laughs> um, I, I kind of want to double down though. I want to, you know, somebody coming into this going, why, why did we make this? Why was this created? And, you know, as it's noted, it's not a malicious intent from the, from the beginning. Instead, uh, there was a purpose for the creation of these kinds of, uh, these tools, which you, you outlined in the article. Do you want to talk about, uh, natural language processing and what, what we wanted to do with it? Yeah. So some of the kind of the, the big branches of AI are like, can we teach uh, a machine to see? And that's sort of like image processing. And then there's, can we teach them language? And for a long time, sort of the language area of that has lagged behind some of the image uh, advances. And part of that is because language is just sort of a really difficult problem. We have infinite ways of talking and different combinations of words. And so I think there has been a bit of a breakthrough in that area due to this use of what are called pre-trained language models. And the innovation is kind of, really, kind of that they just are using a ton more data. So they are uh, taking um, a model that is trained to predict the next word in a sentence, and they're just training it on you know millions of websites. OpenAI's um, algorithm GPT-2 was trained on 8 million websites. They mm. went to Reddit and just like followed the links of any Reddit post that had, you know, a couple of upvotes. And, um, and that volume of data made these language models better than they ever have been before. And there's also sort of a tweak that they've made to the network architecture so that they were able to use that much data. So before language modeling was done with recurrent neural networks, and there's just some hard limit it's on how much data is practical to run through uh, something like that. They switched over to this, um, came out of Google's research lab actually, it's called Transformer, and it allows you to process the data more efficiently, which means they can use a lot more of it. And so that's kind of opened up um, a lot of advances across the field of natural language processing. Oh, wow, that's pretty... Pretty fascinating. I still would like to see some of this stuff with my own eyes and in, in, as it's processing and going through and seeing how it's trying to learn mm -hmm. uh, the way people use language and, and, and just communicate amongst one another. Because when you think about Reddit, that's a whole different language <laughs> <laughs> going on over there versus, yes. say, checking out what's happening on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. You know, there's different conversations, different contexts. Sometimes it's the same um, 
final meaning, but it's just a delivery on it. But that's pretty fascinating to see the work that's going into all of this. And Ms. Fong, we really do appreciate you joining us today. Where can we find you and all of your work here online? So I uh, publish on Vox's YouTube channel. It's uh, youtube.com slash Vox. And I'm on Twitter at Joss Fong. All right. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. You all take care. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. All right, folks, Tech News Weekly publishes each and every Thursday here at twit.tv slash TNW. So that's where you can go to subscribe to the show in audio and in our video formats. You out there can be a part of the show by emailing us at tnw at twit.tv. I do believe we just got an email the other day, or maybe it was a, it was a tweet, but someone was uh, sharing their recipe for creating hand sanitizer um, so that you don't have to, you know, since it's a lot of places it's sold out. So I do appreciate that um, message. I'll have to find that tweet and share it in the show notes. Very nice. Uh, You can follow us on social media. Uh, You follow Twit on Twitter at T-W-I-T, simply Twit. If you want to follow us on Instagram, which I really recommend you do, there's a lot of great content there. It's Mm -hmm. at twit.tv. And if you're on TikTok, it's at twittalk on uh, (laughs) on that platform. If you want to tweet at me, I'm at Micah Sargent and pretty much at Micah Sargent on all the social media platforms. Later today, I've got a hands-on iOS coming out that's going to be a deep dive into the camera app. So stay tuned for that. Pretty doggone cool. Very nice. And you can find me at Ant underscore Pruitt on Twitter and Instagram. Pretty much all of the social media is out there. Just Ant underscore Pruitt. And thanks to our folks over here and our wonderful technical director booth, Mr. John A. and Mr. Brockman, just making us look and sound good here in the studio. Really do appreciate all of your work. And that's it, folks. We will see you all next time on Tech News Weekly. Take care.